Good morning. So kids, I want you to look at the back of the worship folder real quick. You're going to see some fill in the blanks. So if you pay attention, fill in those blanks, Danny, and then show Mr. Lee after the service, he has a special prize for you. So Mr. Lee, can you raise your hand real quick so all the kids know where to go? Right there, the man walking down the center of the aisle. So go see him after the service, and he has a special prize for you. Today, we're going to be looking at Romans 10, 5 through 13. But before we get there, kids, I need your help with something. So raise your hand if you had a good Christmas. Oh, I see some kids at heart as well. Okay, so I need you to stand up now, all the kids. Stand up, please. Levi, stand up real quick. Yeah, dude. And then I want you to yell out what was the favorite, one of your favorite presents you got. Yell it out so everyone could hear. Play-Doh. Oh, I heard Play-Doh. Ava, what was yours? Oh, a book. Excellent. Okay, you could have a seat. Now, I want you to think about the most favorite gift you've ever received. Then, think about something a hundred times better than that. Today, I'm going to tell you about a gift that's greater than any gift you could ever imagine. And I know what you're thinking. There is no way that you're going to come up with something better than what I'm thinking about right now. But just wait. We're going to see that Jesus is the greatest gift that you could ever receive. So grab your Bibles and look at Romans 10, 5 through 13 with me. This is a pretty complex passage, so as we read it, don't just tune out. Stick with me, we'll be okay. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So this is God's word for us this morning. Let's pray. Father, may your Holy Spirit help us to understand this passage. Give us a mind to understand, Lord, a heart to love you more, and help us take what we learn today to, and use it to help us live for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So look back at verse 5 with me. Paul, who God used to write a bunch of the New Testament, he wrote in verse 5, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. So in these verses, Paul uses a big word, righteousness. But it's pretty simple. To have righteousness, it means to be good, to be right, and to be pleasing to God. And when you have righteousness, when you're right and good and pleasing to God, that's when you have a relationship with God. And having a relationship with God is the most important thing in the world. It's what satisfies our deepest wants and desires. So we see here, to be righteous, all you have to do is follow God's laws. I mean, pretty simple, right? There's one huge problem. In order to be righteous by following God's law, we would have to follow God's law perfectly because God is perfect. So kids, I want you to look at me real quick. Think, have you ever lied? 
Have you ever been mean? I even see some people really honest raising their hands. That's good. Have you ever been selfish? How about any of you out there who haven't listened to your parents? Or have you talked back to your parents? Oh, that's a big one. All those are examples of breaking God's law. Another word the Bible uses for breaking God's law is sinning. But it's not just you. All of us sin, which means that none of us can be righteous by following God's law. And in case you don't believe me, watch this. Adults, raise your hand if you've ever sinned. Keep your hands up. Kids, look around. Stand up and look around if you want. Everyone has their hands up. And if they don't, they're lying, which has just proven my point. <laughs> Everyone sins. And no one, and actually, Jesus is the greatest gift because we all need a Savior. We need someone to rescue us from our sin because no one follows God's law perfectly. And that's fill in the blank number one. No one follows God's law perfectly. In verse 5 here, Paul's bringing our attention to the fact that we cannot make ourselves right with God. Which means, sadly, that if we try to make ourselves right in our own power, in our own way, we will fail. Which means that we're separated from God. And where we receive punishment for our sins. And that's what the Bible calls as hell. It's kind of like this. So I need Amy to come stand out by the entrance. She's working her way towards there. So Amy and I need to hold hands. There she is. So we need to hold hands. It's really important we hold hands, but none of us are allowed to move. So Amy, without moving your feet, let's try to reach each other. Reach, come on. Okay, here, we're going to cheat a little bit. We can move one leg. So come on, you can stretch for it. Oh, oh. Okay, thanks, Ames. You can go sit down. None of us can be good enough to bridge that gap between us and God. So just like no matter how hard Amy and I tried to reach each other, no matter how long, it would never happen. And in the same way, no matter how hard we try to make ourselves right with God, we can't. But there's some good news. There's actually some incredible news that we have hope. God has sent an amazing gift for us. He sent someone to rescue us from our sin and give us the righteousness we need. Jesus is the greatest gift ever because by trusting him, the Bible tells us that we get his perfect righteousness. So in verses 6 through 7, Paul is driving home the point that if you place your faith in Jesus, if you trust him for the forgiveness of your sins and new life, you don't keep trying to be good enough to earn God's love. You also don't keep trying to pay for your sins that Jesus had already paid for. And then in verses 8 through 10, we see what trusting your life to Jesus and receiving his righteousness looks like. So verses 8 through 10 read, But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So first, we see in verse 8 that those who put their faith in Jesus, they accept the gift of righteousness that Jesus offers. Now, that may seem silly to mention. Like, you, of course, you trust Jesus. You take what he gives you. But it's not that easy. There are tons of Christians out there, people who have grown up in a church and followed Christ for decades, who still, deep down, feel like they have to earn God's love. They feel that if I serve in a certain way, if I do good things, God will love me more. But when I fail, when I sin, God loves me less. But what Paul is saying here is that the gift of righteousness, it's offered not by you and your good works. 
It's offered by God. And it is right there for all who put their faith in him. So this is something that happens in my house on like a daily basis. One of the girls will come up to me and they'll ask, Dad, have you seen that toy? And it will be like right in front of them. And I'll say, yeah, it's right there. And they'll start looking around, start going on the shelf, knocking over things. And I'm like, stop. You don't need to keep looking. You have it. It's right there. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying that when you trust Jesus, you don't have to keep looking anymore. Then, in verse 9 through 10, we see that God is the one that saves you. He will make you righteous. He will make you right and good and pleasing through your faith in Jesus. In these verses where it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. What Paul is saying here is that true faith involves a surrendering and a trusting of all of who you are to him. A heart transformed by God will also have a life transformed by God. That's how powerful Christ's righteousness is. <clears throat> this type of faith, it's a complete and total trust for the forgiveness of your sins. Let me say that again. When you place your faith in Jesus, you're, it's not just agreeing with something. It is placing your complete trust in him to save you, not you to save yourself. And when we do this, God begins to give you the wants and the desires to want what he wants. And he starts to give you the ability to begin to do what Jesus tells you to do. When you place your faith in Jesus, an amazing thing happens. So Amy, one more time, come, to the, come out to the entrance and while she's working her way, I'll start walking. So when you trust your life to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, when you receive his rightness and his goodness, and you are restored to him, that gap that was created between you and God, you know, like that was between me and my adorable daughter, is removed, and you are restored. Thank you. You can go sit down. To perfect relationship to him. That's what Christ's righteousness accomplishes. Think about how amazing the gift of Jesus is. You receive the righteousness of Jesus, which means that when you trust your life to him, you are made perfectly pleasing to God. And that's fill in the blank number two. And for all you out there, don't miss that. When you trust your life to Jesus, you are made perfectly pleasing to God. Now, this is really cool. This is one of the reasons I picked this passage. Look at verse 12. Paul wrote, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. When you place your faith in Jesus, God bestows his riches on you. It means he showers them on you. Literally, it means God's making you rich. So imagine your favorite thing in the world. And imagine you just have tons of it. I have a daughter, Addie. She loves catacorns. You heard me. It's half cat, half unicorn. And just to, on a side note, if you ever want to write children's books, just pretty much take an animal, a fairy, a unicorn, and princesses and just smash it together you have a hit. But anyways, catacorns. She loves catacorns. So she's probably imagining right now that someone's given her a catacorn ranch, saying you just have catacorns to play with and take care of for the rest of your life. She would feel like the richest girl in the history of humanity. That would be a dream come true. But the truth is, the riches that God bestows on us is far greater than our wildest dreams. By trusting your life to Jesus, you're made new. You're made righteous, which means you're made right with God, which means that you have a relationship with the creator of the universe. 
it means that you get to know as well as be known by the one who knew you before you ever existed. In this, when you place your faith to Jesus, you have access to God, you have a relationship with God, and you get to enjoy God for all eternity. Jesus is the greatest gift you could ever receive. I want to just take a moment, because I tend to rush. Take a moment and just let that sink in. If you're sitting here bored, remind yourself of how incredible the gospel is. Let that warm your heart a little bit. Let that grow your faith. Let that convict you of complacency or apathy and move you towards love and service and giving your life to God because he's worthy. Think of how incredible God is that we would sin against him, but he would come to the earth in his son, live the life we couldn't, die the death we deserve, and then raise from the dead so that all who place their faith in him are rescued from their sin and they're restored to God. That's what it means to have God's riches showered upon you. And honestly, that's what it means to be saved. So what do we do with this? Well, we see in verse 13 that another reason why Jesus is the greatest gift ever is because being saved is for everyone who trusts their life to him. So if you're paying attention, that's fill in the blank number three. Being saved, the gift of Jesus is for everyone everyone who trusts their life to him. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter where you're from or where you live. And get this one, it doesn't matter what you've done. The gift of Jesus is for everyone who trusts their life to him. Because The awesome thing is we have a perfect rescuer in Jesus Christ. So first, I want to encourage you. Trust your life to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and have new life. That's the first thing. If you do anything with the message, do that. It doesn't mean life will be easy. It doesn't mean that you get everything you want. It doesn't mean that you won't have struggles and challenges and bad things will happen. But what it does mean is that you get to start to be the person that God created you to be. And you get to start to live the life that God has planned for you. When you do this, you no longer have to go through life trying to be better and be good in your own strength. You get to live by the grace of God. You get to live in the power of God and you get to live for the glory of God. And if you're already a Christian, I would just encourage you. Remind yourself of that occasionally. A lot of times it's easy to just accept Christ and then move on. But, I mean, on a daily basis, preach the gospel to yourselves. Remind yourself of who God is and what he's done you'll be amazed about of simply doing that, your faith will grow. Your love for God will grow. Your understanding of scripture will grow. I mean, God works miraculously through that. And then the second thing, share the gift of Jesus with those around you. When God saves you, he gives you the responsibility of giving the gift of Jesus through the church. And I know that sounds a little silly, but it's important to be part of the church, to be giving, to be serving, to be worshiping God with other believers. And I don't, I don't accept the excuse like, oh, I'm too little or too young. I don't care how little you are. You could be serving to help this church share the gift of Jesus with the people around us and all over the world. So kids especially, I I want to challenge you to this. I want you to think of a way that you could help, 
that you could help the church. And if you can't come up with something, come find me. Talk to your parents. Talk to your grandparents. Talk to Pastor Lynn. We'll find a place where you could help share the gift of Jesus through the church. But God also gives us the responsibility of sharing Jesus with those in our daily lives. So think about someone in your life who you see on a frequent basis who doesn't know Jesus. Maybe it's a friend at school. Maybe it's a teacher. Maybe it's a neighbor or family member. But I want you to think of one person that you could share the gift of Jesus with. And that's uh, fill in the blank number four. Write the name of one person that you could share the gift of Jesus to. A lot of times we like to make this really difficult. We get all stressed out and we don't do it. We get really awkward usually. Awkwardness is a key to this. But it's pretty simple. Pray for the person. Pray that God will open their eyes that they could accept Jesus as their Savior. Then, take time to get to know them and help them get to know you. Maybe invite them to church. Invite them to life group that you're spend, so that you're spending more time together. And then all you have to do is share what Jesus has done. All you, could, all you have to do is tell them why Jesus is so important to you. Tell them Jesus died for my sins. I just learned last Sunday I received his righteousness, which means I'm right and good and pleasing to God. It means I have eternal life. Like, that's all you have to do. And if we take seriously the responsibility to give the gift of Jesus through the church, as well as individually, we'll see God glorified. We'll see God made famous. And we will have the wonderful, amazing, extraordinary privilege of seeing others experience the greatest gift ever. Let's pray. Father, help us to see how incredible it is that our standing with you, our relationship with you, how you love us isn't contingent on us, that we receive the righteousness of God. We thank you for your incredible grace. We thank you for your incredible mercy, Lord. And help us, Lord, give us the courage and opportunities to share the amazing gift of Jesus with those around us. In Jesus' name we pray.